And Greg McElroy joining us in his normal Monday slot. Greg, of course, part of the broadcast Saturday night on ESPN from Fayetteville. So, Greg, give us uh, your, your takeaway from a wild night in Fayetteville. It was amazing, Paul. It was probably one of the coolest environments I've been in in quite a while. Granted, takeaway 2020, no environment that year was going to rival anything I'd seen. But I tell you what, as far as just making it difficult for the opposition, uh, it was remarkable. I mean, they, they legitimately in the stands, Paul, had an impact on the game. Hudson Card, and as you kind of read through some of the lines that Steve Sarkeesian had in some of his post-game press conference and then also some of the things he said today, they're making a quarterback change because Hudson Card looked uncomfortable and looked antsy. Well, that antsiness comes from the environment, I think, to a certain extent. So it was an amazing performance from not just the football team, but from those that are passionate about Razorback football. And then if we want to get down to the actual tape and the film and the performance, that was about as physically imposing along the defensive line as I've seen in some time. They were absolutely living in the Texas backfield and not allowing Texas to do anything with an outstanding running back in B. John Robinson. So Arkansas is not going away. There's a team that found themselves this past week. And if they can carry some of that momentum moving forward, they'll be a very difficult out in the West. And, and it's interesting because you know we, we, we have been obsessing over October 9th, Greg, but uh, before that, uh, Arkansas will take on Texas A&M, which has been dealt some, some pretty bad blows uh, without Haynes King available for that game, and, and who knows how much longer. Based on what you saw against Colorado, I realize that game was bumping right up against your broadcast, and uh, what you have now seen from from Arkansas trying to, to match them up against Texas A&M. I know we're jumping ahead a little bit, but how much has changed? <laughs> uh, quite a bit, Paul. <laughs> and obviously, Haynes King's injury is so disappointing. I hate it for him. Uh, but Zach Calzada was a guy that gave Haynes King quite a run throughout the course of the spring, summer, and even into fall camp. Now, Haynes King ultimately was determined to be the better option, but now with him sidelined, at least they have a capable backup in Zach Calzada. I watched Calzada in the spring game, Paul. Uh, I think he's excellent, and he's a really good thrower. So I actually think him being in the lineup against a team like Arkansas might actually work to Texas A&M's advantage because if they're going to live – Right now, it's probably going to have to be through the air. That offensive line the other day, not great. Calzada did not look comfortable at all. But let's also take last week against Colorado with a slight grain of salt. Calzada was getting backup reps all week and was thrust into a difficult spot at altitude, which is even increasingly difficult on the quarterback, especially when trying to push the ball downfield. So take A&M, push them to the side just for a half second. Let me talk quickly why Arkansas is a difficult matchup for A&M. If A&M wants to live on the ground, you're not going to be able to run the ball with a lot of efficiency against Arkansas. I'd be surprised if you could. Even with Arkansas's three-down defensive line, they're heavy, they're big, they're difficult to move, and they're very sure tackles at the second level. Now, at this point, I haven't heard an update as to what's going on with their outstanding linebacker, Grant Morgan. He was walked off the field with a lot of help on Saturday night. So if he's back, hoping that he is, and this will be one of the better front sevens in the SEC. But if he's out, they at least have capable depth behind him with both Henry and Bumper Poole. But if those two guys, if one of them were to go down, then they might run into some issues. So they're good right now along the front. It's just whether or not they can sustain injuries throughout the course of the season, which are bound to happen in the SEC because of how physical the play is. So starting lineup, very good. The depth is what I question. And uh, at this point, they're not having to rely on a lot of depth because they are excellent, really, and they're one and two deep. Greg, what's the quarterback situation look like in Knoxville for Josh Heupel? Well, watching Joe Milton's increasingly fr frustrating. I don't really know how to, how to describe what it was that I saw, and, and we talked about it throughout the course of last week and leading up to the game. Joe Milton had to hit three deep balls. Three. If he hits three deep balls, because, I, look, I played against Pat Narduzzi. I know exactly what Pat Narduzzi does. He wants to sell out, get those safeties involved in the run game. you got to throw it over, there, over his head, and if you can do that, you'll beat him convincingly. If you can't do that, you're going to get beat. Well, Joe Milton didn't do very well on his deep balls, and as a result, they lost by a touchdown. Now, Hendon Hooker gave them a chance. It was a little shaky early, but he settled down as the game went along. What I want to see moving forward, and I think the quarterback competition should be open, assuming Milton's back healthy and available moving forward, I'd like to see that quarterback competition open up. Because if Joe Milton continues to overthrow deep balls, no one's going to catch an overthrown deep ball. 
it's not going to happen. At least if you underthrow it, there's a few things that could happen. One, you can get pass interference. Two, your receiver can go up, make a catch on a 50-50 contested catch situation. Or three, it's potentially going to fall incomplete. Underthrown deep balls are so much harder on the defense than they are on the offense because the defender never looks for the football. So I think that Joe Milton, if he continues to overthrow guys, he's going to have to get out. Just It's too many plays being left on the field right now by Tennessee's offense, and they're just not that good. They're not good enough, excuse me. They, are, they can be good. They showed some signs or some glimpses at times on Saturday. They're not good enough at this point to leave that many plays on the field against quality competition. So uh, I think open it up. I thought Hooker did a good job in relief. And we'll see where they go from this point forward because Hooker, by all accounts, did not have a great camp. But sure enough, with the lights bright on Saturday, he performed admirably and gave him a chance. Thanks for watching ESPN on YouTube. For live streaming sports and premium content, subscribe to ESPN+.